is that the Russian gold mines can't get the stuff out of the ground fast enough no. in order to satisfy uh, the Reserve Bank's uh, demand for gold. Oh, no. You know, so, so I think I, I think there are a number of reasons that are probably specific to the Central Bank of Russia, rather than, let's say, um, necessarily the beginning of a trend of other central banks uh, deciding to to go and buy silver. I mean, I wouldn't rule. I wouldn't rule other banks, central banks, buying silver out. I wouldn't rule that out. But I think Russia, the Russian central bank is in this um, rather peculiar position of really not being able to pad out her reserves with fiat currencies. And I mean, quite clearly, it would drive the price higher. But I think we've got to look at the motives uh, of um, the, the Reserve Bank. I can see two reasons why they would do this. Uh, the first is that... Um, in the longer term, however that is, whether that's one month or 10 years, um, they probably see um, the need for uh, coins, coinage. So uh, they would need to acquire, I mean, you could, you know, you could either do it as a central bank uh, reserve asset or, um, you know, something part of a wealth fund or whatever, but they would need to acquire stocks of silver in order to be able to do that. So I think that's that's one thing we ought to bear in mind. I think the other thing is the one of um, the problems that the Reserve Bank actually faces, and that is uh, being banned, if you like, from um, owning fiat currencies uh, by us. So she can't even put, uh, if you like, uh, currency her you know her her own reserves. She can't actually get her own reserves up by increasing dollars, increasing euros, or whatever it might be. I mean, she's probably got enough Chinese yuan to, you know, that she might be comfortable with. Um, and I think, therefore, that she's probably doing, you know, we're all doing here, I mean, the three of us, not understood, if you like, by the majority of people, uh, thinking, well, uh, you know, it's we're not going to stick just to fiat. What we will do is we will also accumulate monetary metals. And mm. half the answer probably is that the Russian gold mines can't get the stuff out of the ground fast enough no. in order to satisfy the Reserve Bank's uh, demand for gold. So I think I, I think there are a number of reasons that are probably specific to the Central Bank of Russia, rather than, let's say, um, necessarily the beginning of a trend of other central banks uh, deciding to to go and buy silver. I mean, I wouldn't rule. I wouldn't rule other banks, central banks buying silver out. I wouldn't rule that out. But I think Russia, the Russian central bank, is in this rather peculiar position of really not being able to pad out her reserves with fiat currencies. The Silver Institute reckons there's been a supply deficit for the last four years. People in the industry, uh, or like in the LBMA or whatever, you know, will say that, well, you know, there's plenty of above ground um, uh, stocks, you know, in the form of, in, you know, held by investors and strategic funds and all the rest of it. So that, you know, th there isn't really a shortage. Those will be drawn down on. But, you know, the, the problem you have with that sort of approach is that, you know, investors and um, holders of, um, you yeah. know, you know, stocks in reserve, um, you know, they can see that uh, this is a situation where, you know, if they let us say, let stuff out, they're not going to get it back. So what do you do? You just hang on to it. even hang on to it. It. The first thing, there's absolutely nothing on the money front. Um, you know, it, they, they were saying, basically, there, there were two things that perhaps we were looking for. One was um, a trade settlement currency of some sort. Um, now, that has been effectively ruled out. Um, uh, and that's realistic because you have to come up with something which is better than the dollar which you're replacing. Otherwise, people won't use it. It's as simple as that. Really needs you to have something which is gold backed. And I'm not sure that that would ever make the cut with, um, you know, with the existing BRICS membership, particularly with India being very much against it. So that's the first thing. Um, but, but also, while we're talking about currencies, the overall political background was one of extreme nervousness um, on two levels. Firstly, with China and uh, Russia concerned about not provoking America uh, unnecessarily. From China's point of view, she's always had the strategy of let, of let your opponent make all the mistakes. 
And the Russians have been doing this brilliantly as far as the Chinese are concerned. So, you know, just just let them carry on making the mistakes. Don't um, suddenly start to get aggressive and, um, you know, get them to sort of suddenly wake up and think, hold on, we've got a better way of dealing with this. So so that that's on that level. The other level of nervousness were amongst um, Brit nations, uh, the other nations that attended who are looking to join. Um, and uh, their nervousness is that America... Um, you know, could well boomerang back on their trade. Uh, you know, if they owe dollars, and most of them owe dollars big time, um, which, yeah, you know, may be to the IMF. But I mean, the thing is that the IMF is controlled by the Americans. The Americans can call in the shots. So, you know, you don't want to upset your, your bank manager, as it were. Uh, on top of that, of course, you, get, you know, those Americans uh, are not above uh, creating regime change in foreign nations. So, you know, there's a, there's, there's a lot of nervousness about how this would be approached. So you can see that while, um, you know, some people are getting quite excited about, uh, you know, the, the whole thing, you, they're beginning to see a bigger picture and the meat thinking is immediately going to happen. No, this is something which, as far as China and Russia are concerned, is likely to take some time. They're going to respond to events, not create them. The other thing which is very interesting, so um, that deals with the you know, with the, with the money side. They are continuing to work, incidentally, on uh, having, uh, you know, a sort of swift alternatives and, you know, all the bells and whistles that are required for that. And the ability for uh, banks to settle in currencies with each other without using the dollar is you know, still a work in progress, etc. So that's all rather boring. The other thing which I don't think has been really noted is that they have created a new class of uh, membership, which they now call partner status. We might call it association, you know, an associate member of BRICS. But this, you know, they, they call it partner, which is exactly the same thing. It means that all these new countries can gradually sort of, um, uh, you know, assimilate themselves into a sort of common BRICS um, uh, approach, if you like, to trade. And it's really, it's, it's huge, great, Free trade areas, really, what it boils down to. 